2 Samuel chapter 7, and um, I'm going to pick up uh, kind of where we left off last week. We're going to deal with the issue, um, the doctrine, and the blessings of being a son of God. I believe that when you are saved and born again, that you become the Son of God. The whole idea of being born again is that God is your Father now. Okay? He's, that's what we pray. We pray, Abba, Father. That phrase, Abba, about a 70s Scandinavian rock band. Okay? It is the Hebrew term for Papa, Daddy, Dada, Abba. Right? That is a familiarity term. Uh, that is a term that you that you personally would call your father. You call him daddy. You call him a very personal name. God is a very loving father. He takes very, very good care of his children. Can I get an amen? He feeds us well. Amen? He feeds us so well we can't lose weight sometimes. Amen? He takes he pays our bills. He keeps us uh, where we need to be. He keeps us in line. He keeps us protected. Amen. He's a very, very good father to us. And if we get out of line, he's also very good at something else. Okay? So let's look at that tonight. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. I have it up on the screen. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. So God was promising to David that Solomon was going to be his son. We saw that. We see it there in 2 Samuel. Uh, we see the mirror of it in Psalm 89. There's a whole uh, thing there about being, uh, there it is there, verse 26 through 34. We've read that. So I want to move on a little bit tonight and just talk about what it means to be a son of God. Galatians chapter 4, you can turn there in your Bibles. I'll give you about three or four seconds. Turn there. Let's see how fast you are. Those tabs work out pretty good, don't they, Brother Sterling? Amen. Sometimes when you can see them, all right? But anyway, and if you can't, just grab a tab and start working your way through. At least you know you're going to get to the right place eventually. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Now I want you to get that. And I want you to think about how true this is. When Christ comes back, and he is coming back, amen? I shared this with Ryan. And I, I thought this last night. It was just, it blessed my heart. This number 33. Jesus was 33 years old, okay, when he was crucified on the cross. And the 33rd book of the Bible is Malachi. In Malachi chapter 5, you have a prophecy of the first coming of Jesus Christ. Though Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be uh, small among the nations, or I can't remember it, but anyway, it prophesies the, the coming of Christ to Bethlehem, uh, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. So in the 33rd book of the Bible, you have the prophecy of the first coming of Jesus. 33 books later is the 66th book of the Bible, which is Revelation. Revelation is a prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Isn't that neat how that works out? And they say that man put that together. I don't think so. I think God, His order and His perfection applies to everything. Amen? But anyway, where was I going with that? That was pretty good. I don't remember what it meant. But anyway, when Christ comes back, He's going to rule for a thousand years. And the Bible says... We're going to rule with him. We are going to be lords with Christ. Now Christ is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So it's not like we're going to be equal with Christ. He will be the supreme Lord. 
and we will be lords underneath him. And that's what he's teaching here. That the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. Right now, you and I are expressed as the children of God. And right now, we're not lord of the... We can't just tell the world how we want it to be and the world bows down to us. Some people think that. It doesn't work that way. Amen? So we are given the title of Lord and a son of God, but it's not been manifested yet what that's going to be. So verse 2, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. This is what we're doing here tonight. We're being tutored. God is governing us. God is teaching us. He's teaching us about the kingdom. So, verse 3, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Do you get that? We have been adopted by our Father. And Jesus is not jealous now that he has to share his inheritance with his brethren. Jesus is elated that he can share his inheritance with his brethren. Somebody say amen. Okay? He's not trying to get the father. Now, Daddy, be sure you put me in the will first. Daddy, be sure you give me everything. That's not Jesus. Amen? So, verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now that, there's two things here. Number one, that is another reason why you cannot be saved and not have the Holy Spirit. The way, I guess, I don't know if all Pentecostals teach this and all Charismatics, but they teach this idea that you can be saved and not have the Holy Ghost. And that comes later and you have, you got to speak in tongues and you got to manifest this and manifest that. I'm telling you that if you're saved, you have the spirit of Jesus Christ in you because now God is not some strange God to you. He's your father. And I can remember years ago, I used to just, even in my personal prayer, it was, you know, God this and God that. But now I realize that God is my father. And I... Tell my father, Father, thank you for this. Father, thank you. Father, I love you. Thank you for loving me. It's all about Father, 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 because that's who he is to me. God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Verse 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. He's inherited all things. And if you are, as Christ said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He said, if you abide in me and me abide in you, and I like, how, I like how this is. Christ abiding in us is his words abiding in us. And that's another deal. I mean, I've been talking here for quite a while about the Bible. I recorded another watchman today about the case for a pure Bible. And I'm just telling you, if God's word's not pure, I have no reason to be here. Because, I mean, I put in here today, the recording is going to come out Sunday. I put in here today about Deuteronomy 18 and the rules for how you can tell whether or not God's speaking or not. If it's ever wrong one time, it's not God. God has a high standard for perfection. And all you have to do is be wrong one time as a prophet. And if you miss it one, you can be, you can make a hundred predictions and 99 of them come true. And in this world, you'll gain fame and fortune. But if you're wrong one time, according to God's standard, nobody has to listen to you. That's true of the Bible. The Bible is a prophet. It is the word of prophecy. And if it's wrong one time, I'm not listening to it ever again. I'll close it up. I'll leave. And go find something else to do. I don't know what I can do at 50 years old. Anyway. But anyway, we are an heir of God through Christ. Christ abiding in us and his words abiding in us. And we abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to um, Romans chapter 8. 
Romans chapter 8, while I read Revelation 21, 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now, I can tell you there's some people that don't like this verse. They don't like this verse because it mentions overcoming. And I'm of the firm, committed belief that if you don't overcome and you don't last, you don't, you're not saved. Okay? I'm, I am. I'm not one of these that says you pray a little prayer and you're good for the rest of your life. Go do whatever you want to. That ain't what the Bible says. That's not what it teaches. Okay? He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God and he shall be my son. Um, I don't know if I have this. Yeah, I do. I have it. So I'll wait for that in a little bit. I was thinking 2 Corinthians. I, I will be his God and he shall be my son. Romans 8 verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Remember what I said the other day about the Spirit of God in Romans chapter 8. You can rightfully substitute or equate the Spirit of God with the Word of God. They are one and the same. So if you are led by the Spirit of God, you will be led by the Word of God. Does that make sense to everybody? Because we have people, and it's not just in charismatic groups either. We have people who say that they follow the living word, meaning the spirit of God. But they don't necessarily follow everything that's in the Bible because they believe that some things in the Bible are wrong. Well, here's the problem with that. How do we follow a spirit without firm knowledge that what that spirit said to us is true? Because anybody, in fact, all of us, at one time or another, are led about by emotions. And we use emotions as, I guess, the guidepost of, well, I just feel like that it's right. Right? And I've heard people justify and excuse sin by saying, well... I asked God and I just felt like it was okay. That's not the Spirit of God. Just because you got a little tingle on the back of the neck, or you, you cried a little bit, or you got a little bit happy, you got some kind of, sort of emotional response. That does not mean that God was speaking about that situation. The Bible says, test the Spirit. I was thinking about this today. And uh, I'm, don't let me forget about it. I'm going to put together, I've learned I've got to take notes on this stuff or I'm going to forget it. I'm going to put together a little deal, a presentation, and I don't know when I'm going to do it, on standards. On standards. Okay? Who in here knows about medical standards? Any, I mean, just anything. Medical standards. What is a CC, Alicia? Huh? Cubic centimeter. So if the doctor says, uh, nurse, administer 300 cc's of dioxin. <laughs> okay? That's poison. <laughs> okay? What if somebody decided that their version of a cc was going to be different than another doctor's version of a cc? Pharmaceutical company sent out a, rec a dosage recommendation and said 20 milligrams of this medicine, 20 cc's of this medicine. And a group of physicians or a group of surgeons or a group of doctors got together and they formed their own standard. So 20 cc's of a medicine now to this group is different than it was from the pharmaceutical company. And they want you to be their patient. I wouldn't do it. No way, no how. See, they changed the standard, didn't they? Okay? Um, construction. You're going to frame a wall for your house or an addition. So you go to the lumber yard and you order pre-cuts. What that is, is on an eight-foot wall, there's a way to build that wall and you order two by fours that normally would, the wall's gonna be eight foot, but the two by fours that you're gonna to put to frame that wall up cannot be eight feet. 
because you have a footer and a header. So these pre-cuts are cut automatically so they fit right in where the header and the footer is. They just fit right in so the carpenter doesn't have to cut every one of these. And then drywall all over the country is made four feet and four feet. And that leaves, what about inch on the bottom, Sterling? Three quarter of an inch on the bottom? So if that wall is too short, those two sheets of drywall are not going to fit. Somebody's going to have to cut every bottom sheet of that drywall. Why? Because it wasn't the right standard. Somebody didn't use the right measurement. Okay? One change of a standard affects an endless list of how things are done. Okay? It's important. It's important in medicine. It's important in building. Building has building codes are standards. It's important in technology, in science. It is important in every area of life. But for some reason, when it comes to salvation and religion, for some reason, John, we're being told that let's get out four or five standards. And let's find out what God's standard is amongst these five Bibles here. Doesn't make sense to me. That dog don't hunt. Amen? So I, I may put together something like that. And if anybody online wants to help me out or you guys send it to me, all right? But anyway, uh, where were we? Romans 8. Yeah. For ye have not received, verse 15, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, where, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. See, there's a double witness there to that idea. Number one, we've been adopted. Number two, we can now, instead of calling God God, we can call him Father. Because he truly is now our father in every sense of the word. He's our father. The spirit of itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. There again, another witness to what, what, it, what happens in becoming a son of God. Then if you are a son of God, you receive the inheritance. Amen. If, if, so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Look back up on the screen. Look at Revelation 21, 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And then, then Paul says down here in Romans 8, that we are joint heirs with Christ, if, so be we suffer with him. I mean, stop and think about it. In the parable of the seed and the sower, when the seed is sown upon stony ground, in other words, the seed took, it, it, it started sprouting up grass and it took root a little bit, but it wasn't able to much because of the, the rocks in the ground. Well, that was fine during springtime because in springtime, that little bit of ground is getting enough rain to satisfy that seed, satisfy that sprout. But when it gets to be late June, July, into August, and nobody's seen rain for two and a half months, you can tell where the rocks are and where the stony ground is. Why? Because the heat got turned on and the tribulation came in and that grass that suffered and it wasn't deep enough with its roots, it died. It didn't last. And how many people have we seen, Sterling, Linda, Rose, in our lifetime, how many people have we seen come in, go out? Tribulation. Suffering came. They decided they didn't want that. So they popped out. And they're not coming back. They decided that they didn't want to give up things. And sacrifice was out of the question. They didn't want to give up their, their drinking. They didn't want to give up chasing women. They didn't want to give up this. They didn't want to give up that. They had stony ground. And so the heat came out. There was suffering. They were told they were going to have to do without. They decided they didn't want to do that. So out they went. 
persecution came, they gave up. Tribulation trials came, suffering came, they buzzed out. That's why you have it in Revelation 21. Him that overcometh shall inherit all things. And in Romans 8, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And if you have your Bible open, where it says, uh, if so be that we suffer with him, if you want to write 1 Peter next to that, that would be a great book that parallels what that says there. The whole of 1 Peter is about enduring in suffering. Did Christ suffer? And he was sinless. Who are we? And some people don't get that. They say, well, I, bless God, I, my sins are forgiven. I don't have to suffer for my sins. You're not suffering for sin. That's chastening. You're suffering for obedience. You're suffering because you're taking a stand for the Lord. And you're not backing down. That's why you're suffering. And some people, to them, that is a foreign concept. And they want nothing to do with it. And it comes from different groups. One of them is that wealth and prosperity crowd. That cross-bearing and sacrifice and suffering. To them, that's, that shows you don't have enough faith with God. That's because you've got sin in your life. You get rid of sin in your life, you wouldn't be suffering like that. That is not what the Bible says. If we're going to be sons of God, there's going to be harm inflicted on us. Okay? Just get used to it. We're going to suffer. We're going to go through hard times. I don't like them any more than anybody else does. I hate them. But they always bring about a good effect in us, don't they? So he said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of of the sons of God. And you can keep reading Romans 8 if you want to. And it, I mean, it's just beautiful. It, it talks about how we groan. Creatures groaning. Waiting for the adoption. To wit, the redemption of the body. I can't wait to get rid of this body. If my doctor won't fix me and the insurance company won't go along with it, then I'll just be ready for rapture. Amen? I'll be ready for it. Second Corinthians chapter 6, turn there. Powerful, powerful passage here. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What area does that apply to? Only one? If you're asked to join an organization of some kind, I'd find out what they believe, what they stand for, what they do, how they do it. And if you find anything inconsistent, incompatible with what they do, how they do it, what they say, how they say it, or anything like that, don't join them. Business partnerships. I don't think they're necessarily bad. They can go bad and it causes problems amongst what used to be friends. That, that's happened. But to go into a business partnership with a lost person, you're asking for trouble. Because the lost person, you know, the IRS is going to come down and say, you know, something ain't right. The lost person is going to say, hey, we need to cover this up. And you're going to have to say, uh, I can't do that. Well, they're going to come after us. I don't care. We can't do that. I can't do that. I was asked by a guy, you know who I'm talking about, to be in business with him years ago, drywall and painting. And it didn't take me long to find out who he was, was and what he wanted. He was dead broke and in debt and owed money to the IRS, and he wanted me to go borrow money and get into business with him. And he was going to leave me holding the bag. And I said no. So he went around telling everybody I was a bad person. Be not equally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? You can apply that everywhere. But apply that to the Bible. 
If a verse is right according to the original inspired manuscripts, that's light. If the verse next to it is wrong because it wasn't translated right or there's a copyist error or something like that, that's darkness. Light and darkness cannot exist in the same Bible. Cannot exist in the same Bible, people. What communion hath light with darkness? On the first day of creation, God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light good. Universally, light equals good and darkness equals bad, even in movies. A lot of times in movies, the good guys will wear white and the bad guys will wear black. I don't know if you notice that or not, but that's true. Even in, George Lucas did that in Star Wars. Okay, it was very easy to spot Darth Vader, the bad guy. He's all black. Luke Skywalker, all dressed in white. He's the rescue. He's the hero. Okay, I mean, that's how it is. Verse 15, what concord hath Christ with Belial? Concord is a is an agreement between like two kingdoms. They're going to come to an accord and, gr and agree together like in a treaty. And um, Chris Pinto was showing us the Vatican made a concord with Adolf Hitler during World War II. There was an agreement between the Vatican and Hitler. Okay? And... Uh, that tells you something right there, okay? What concord hath Christ with Belial? If, if Adolf Hitler was the devil, why was the Pope, who is the vicar of Christ, making an agreement with him? Okay? Well, apparently the vicar of Christ is not so much the vicar of Christ. Amen? Anyway, what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Four things here. I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Mm -mm, I love that. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. What does that tell you? That if you're involved in something, you need to get out. Amen. If you're in it, you need to get out of it. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. The idea is, is that if you are not willing to come out, God is not your God. There's a picture of that. It looks like a woman who turned into a pillar of salt. Not willing to come out. God said, I'm not your God. Now, Hebrews 12. Turn there. Okay? Now, what I have prepared for tonight, now I'm getting into the message. I won't keep you past nine, I promise. Listen, this will be my third sermon today. And I'm happy about it. Hebrews 12, verse 5. Let's just touch on this and then we'll pick it up next week, all right? Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou wert rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening. Now, see that word if? And let me tell you something. This is conditioned on your salvation. Okay? Your eternal life has conditions. Okay? It is not an unconditional salvation. It has conditions and ifs and guidelines and stipulations. They're not hard to figure out. And they're not works. Okay? A chastening by God is not you working your salvation. Amen. <laughs> if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with son. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without 
chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. I grew up thinking that that word was a curse word, and you know what? It is. It has a curse attached to it. And that curse is you are not a son of God if you will not take the chastening that God gives out. This goes back to that stony ground group. They have, a, they have an issue in their heart. Things that, conditions that they, terms they've made with God. God, you want me in? My refrigerator full of beer comes with me. Believe it or not, there's people that think that way. That's my condition, God. You let me keep my beer drinking. Okay? Well, if God's going to take you in and God sees you drinking that stuff, God's going to deal with you as a son. He's going to take you. He's going to beat the daylights out of you. And so that you never... You know, I tell this story. The only time my dad ever laid a hand on me or my sister, it was my sister. He never hit me, never never whooped me. Mom did. Dad never did. Dad just said it, okay? But my sister smoked one cigarette in her life, just one. She did it out in the open. Mom and Dad standing there at the door watching. Called her in. Did you out there smoking? No, I wasn't smoking. You know, smoke coming out of her. Dad took her in the room. Now, I didn't see what happened. But apparently, Dad let her have it. And that made such an impression on her. That was... She said, you know, I think I'm going to quit smoking. After one. Okay? God dealt with her, or my dad dealt with her because she was his daughter. And dad knew what smoking does. Dad knew what would happen. Dad said, that's not, that's not going to happen. And he beat her. He got her hard. To my knowledge, she now she may have done it once or twice. I don't know, but she don't smoke to this day. And I'm just saying, if you'll let God hurt you when you did something wrong, okay? Now, the lady that I spoke of today, 